the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will forgive the electronic delay this evening, but uh, perhaps the lights will not go out and the uh, tape recorder will work and everything will be fine and now we will get down to business. I don't know whether you deserve more congratulations for being here on a nice spring-like evening than for coming here during the rain and the snow. So you may consider yourself appropriately congratulated. To immediately proceed to business so we will not waste more time, it may seem somewhat peculiar to speak of conservative Judaism in terms of Mordecai Kaplan, but I think it will be easiest to say what I think needs to be said if I talk to you about Mordecai Kaplan and what he stands for, and through Mordecai Kaplan explain to you the tensions uh, and the great assets which are to be found within conservative Judaism in the United States. My purpose in doing so is to tie it up with our general theme for the year, to indicate how a good many Jews in the United States believe it is possible to live as both a modern man and a Jew uh, in our own time. Thus the identity of what it means to be a Jew in our day, uh, as understood by conservative Judaism, is really the theme for tonight, and Mordecai Kaplan is our example. Mordecai Kaplan is, is a good person to pick for <coughs> what I propose to do this evening, because he shows two of the characteristic symptoms of conservative Judaism. And those two symptoms are first, the conservative Jew says that the Orthodox Jew is not modern enough, and second, that the Reform Jew isn't Jewish enough. The conservative Jew hopes to maintain the middle ground by saying both movements are somehow going in the wrong direction. In Orthodoxy, it's not going far enough, and in Reform Judaism, it's going too far. And this is the great appeal of Orthodox Judaism. It associates itself with none of the problems connected with either of the other two movements, but to the contrary, seeks to take within itself the assets that both of them claim. So that, as compared to Orthodox Judaism, it claims to be more modern, in other words, more reformed. And as compared to Reform Judaism, it claims to be more Jewish, hence, in a way, really more Orthodox. Mordecai Kaplan shows both of these traits very strongly. Now, you will recall last week we were discussing how Orthodox Judaism has come into its own in the United States now, how it has become a respectable movement, how now people of all kinds are no longer ashamed to associate with uh, Orthodoxy. It isn't a sign of being foreign-born. To the contrary, Orthodoxy in every respect, political and intellectual, has become accepted among Americans, and that among American Jews, Orthodox Judaism, as an affiliation, if not as a way of life, has become a very strong and vigorous movement and is likely to grow. On the other hand, we pointed out that for many American Jews, probably for the overwhelming number, Orthodox Judaism poses certain problems which, according to most of these Jews at any rate, uh, it has no solution. Now, what are those problems? In brief, those are intellectual problems and problems of Jewish practice. The problems which I described rather glibly last week as the problem of Genesis chapter 1. How do you put together the biblical account of creation with the scientific knowledge that we gather? And the problem of practice which may be briefly described as, may I turn the television set on on Saturday afternoon to watch a cultural program? Now Mordecai Kaplan takes a rather vigorous point of view with regard to both of these issues. And he roundly condemns orthodoxy for not wishing to meet these issues. He does so not because he is perverse or rebellious, but because he feels that in a way orthodoxy is not being true to Judaism. From Kaplan's point of view, Judaism, and particularly Jewish law, has been able to change and develop through the years. In this respect, Kaplan would admit that he shares the Reformed Jewish point of view, that Judaism has not stood still. And he would say that most modern Jews need to pick up from that attitude of Reformed Judaism, that Judaism should change itself and adapt both its intellectual life and its way of observance 
to meet the conditions under which Jews find themselves. So that Kaplan would insist that orthodoxy hasn't been true to Judaism itself. In a way, almost, orthodoxy isn't really the true Judaism. No religion should really ask a man to go against what he can believe, what his conscience requires of him. And this would be Kaplan's first and major difference from orthodoxy, namely, that he would begin with the individual man and his mind and use this as the starting point of what can be considered true or not true. Not the Torah, not the traditional books, but first and foremost, what the individual man and his mind and his conscience, thinking as hard as he can, can come to believe. This is what he would have to believe is true. Now, says Kaplan, taking a look at the Jewish tradition, there are many things which a modern man, a man who's had the benefit of a university education, particularly a man who lives in this scientific age of ours, there are many things which such a man would have to change. He'd have to take a different attitude. Take Genesis chapter 1, for example. If in order to be religious, you must accept that story the way it's written there, even with the benefit of a little midrash or interpretation, the chances are many of your educated and intelligent people aren't going to be able to be religious. That's a terrible thing to do. The most important thing that a religion can do for a man is to help him come to some sense of truth, to some sense of personal fulfillment. Therefore, if we can discover the truth in another way or in another direction, we ought to find it and state it and say that's what we believe. Now, as a student of, of history and the evolution of religions, Kaplan would say, I, I can understand this story and how it arose. It was our people's way, our Jewish people's way, of answering the question, how did the world begin? And it has value. It has wonderful religious messages. But to take it as fact, to take it as history, to believe that this is really what happened, this we cannot do. Now, obviously, we don't have time to go into everything that Kaplan believes intellectually. But perhaps the most radical statement that Kaplan has made has to do with God. And this will be a good example to show how, in a way, Kaplan is somehow more reformed than many of the reformed Jews. He is willing to lead orthodoxy forward in a way that I think even some reformed Jews would be unwilling to go. So says Kaplan, it's easy to talk about Genesis chapter 1. That's a single chapter, even though an important one. But why don't we get down to the real heart of things? Why don't we get down to the question of what kind of a God do we believe in? If we're going to have a religion, we have to talk about God sooner or later. And the reason that most people can't be religious in our day is that they can't find a God that they can believe in. Now, there are two things that we have to do. The first thing is we have to do away with all those primitive magical, superstitious notions that even the Jewish tradition had in it. And secondly, we need to then point out a positive idea of God which Jews can accept. Now that may sound a little strange to you that a bearded, traditionally observant rabbi who is so obviously Jewish to the core should take this point of view with regard to God. After all, what could be more central to the Jewish religion? But you must remember Kaplan's purpose. His purpose is to, is to make it possible for people to believe today, to show them a way that they really could believe. And from his point of view, people want to believe. There is an, an urge, a need, in the part of almost all human beings, which one can see scattered throughout most of human history in almost every culture. There is some desire for a certain kind of religion. Well, just because people go around today and say that they're not really religious. Yes, maybe they say they're not really religious, and they like to brag about it a great deal, but you can't take it terribly seriously. Down in the heart of them, there is a, a hunger and a yearning. And the reason that they say they don't want to be religious is they don't want to believe in the old God. They don't want to believe in the God of the Jewish tradition as they had learned about him, covered with magic and with superstition, and particularly covered with supernatural ideas. It is supernaturalism as applied to God that is, from Kaplan's point of view, the great enemy that must be weeded out. 
And therefore, he proceeds to make war on every kind of expression, every kind of statement, every kind of notion which might interpret God as somehow a person or a figure sitting above and beyond nature and ruling over nature, who really has books in which he keeps the score of who is going to live and who is going to die, the kind of God to whom you pray either to make it rain or not to make it rain, the kind of God who is described as a father and as a king, the kind of God to whom one cries out one's heart in the hope that he will really cure somebody who is sick. This kind of picture of God, who is little more than a human figure blown up large, the kind of God whom you may wheedle, whom you try to get around by flattering, by being nice to, by praising, the kind of God who does miracles, who is a great magician, and at given moments opens up the laws of the universe. This is the God that Kaplan is against. Why? Because he says no modern man can believe in this God. We are today scientific. We are people who have been trained in the natural sciences. And we are accustomed to look at the universe in an entirely different way. We see the universe as ruled by law and order, by great patterns of coherence and unity and intelligence. And as the years go by, we learn more and more of the way in which the universe is governed by this law and order. Therefore, to think of a God who is somehow less than this dramatic, magnificent, unifying pattern of control and, and movement running through the universe is to make God less than he ought to be. To make God less than what our minds could conceive of what we would want and what we could rely on. This is really to reduce God, not to raise him up. And if we're going to be modern, if we're going to be scientific, if we're going to understand the universe this way, we have to try to live with a God who fits in with that kind of universe. Therefore, what we want is not a supernatural God, but a God who may be understood in a naturalistic way. A God who may be understood as we understand the universe. A universe in which there are forces like gravity and light and magnetism. These things we understand because that's part of our way of looking at it. We have to look at God somehow the same way. Therefore, Kaplan would propose a positive idea of what God is like. And he knows nobody can really say what God is like. On the other hand, if we don't have some idea of what God is like and we don't try to describe to ourselves what God is, how can we know whether we believe in him? And if Kaplan is right, that the main reason people don't believe in God is they don't want to be associated with that old fogey, then nothing could be better than to give a definition which one would find both modern and acceptable and religious. Now, what is Kaplan's idea? In the first place, he describes God not as a person, but as a power. God is a power in the universe. Now, whether he is one power or many powers, this is a complicated question. But Kaplan would see God moving through the universe as a power. Any kind of natural force, any kind of energy, whether inside human beings or operating through the universe, that's the kind of thing God is. God is, is like gravity, is like magnetism, is like energy. God is to be understood as another natural force, or rather, as a way of looking at certain natural forces. Because it's obvious that there has to be a certain quality to this. Now, what's the quality to God? God is not just the power, but God is that power in the universe which makes for salvation. Now, that's Kaplan's definition of God. Now, what's salvation? Salvation, Kaplan says, is that which makes for the fulfillment, for the highest development, for the, the growth and fruition of what is potential in man. Salvation is to be understood in terms of the fulfillment of man's potential. All those latent abilities, the intelligence, the morality, the aesthetic sensitivity, all those things which are part of a human being. 
to bring those out to their fullest level, to, to develop them to their highest extent. God, says Kaplan, should be understood as all those forces or powers or processes or movements in the universe which help man to fulfill himself and his potential. Thus God is understood as that which has a relationship to man, that which acts upon man, and acts upon man to, to make him more than he is now. Now there are lots of forces in the universe that do that. There are lots of things going on. Maybe gravity is too simple a one. Maybe light is too simple. But there is a love between people. There is the chemistry that, that puts you together and that gives you the energy to go forward. There are the, the memories of your parents which stir within you to lead you in a given direction. And one can identify lots of these forces and powers which move you to become more than you are today. Now put those all together in your mind. Think of all those forces which help to make you and all men become better, to become the best that you could be. And that's what we mean when we talk about God. Nothing supernatural there, nothing outside the natural order, nothing terribly mysterious or, or frightening or magical or superstitious. To the contrary. This is a way of looking at the universe that a modern and a scientific man could look at and accept. Now, says Cap, this is what we need in the Jewish religion. The, the Orthodox Jew, by holding on to a notion of God, and he really thinks he is a king, by holding on to the miracles, by holding on to the kind of personal relationships where it seems in some of the prayers and some of the practices as if he could, if he does a mitzvah for God, God will have to do good for him. All this needs to be done away with. Because a modern man can't really believe that. But he can believe that there are powers in the universe which help to make him better. And more important than that, the closer he gets to that pow those powers, look what it will do for him. The more sensitive he is toward them, it will help make him more ethical, more aesthetically alive, more intellectually alert. Isn't that what the idea of God is supposed to do? Isn't really the most important thing about God the effect that he has upon the lives of people. And here, by creating this kind of an idea, an idea which is believable, it is possible to have the kind of effect upon people that Judaism wants. Because what does Judaism really want with God? It wants to develop people who are righteous people, people who are using their intelligence and their conscience to make life better for themselves and all mankind. And from Kaplan's point of view, this is therefore a deeply religious and a deeply meaningful idea. And he says it comes right out of the Jewish tradition. He's only put it in terms that a modern man could understand. And he uses the wealth of the Jewish tradition to illustrate that, in one way or another, everything that he has said is to be found in the Jewish tradition. Now this gives you an example of the way in which Kaplan, as a conservative Jew, says that the Orthodox Jews don't want to move forward. He does it with practice, too, as well as with ideas. He says simply and quite, quite deliberately, you cannot hold on to ideas that, that uh, people cannot practice in our own day. Now, I'll have to let the question of whether when they turn the television set on go for a moment and to take a rather obvious example. The standard example, of course, is when used with uh, conservative Judaism, is the question of the aguna. And since I shall have to return to it later this evening, it's quite clear uh, that this is the example I must use, even though it shows certain problems, as we shall see. What is the aguna? The aguna is a term used in Jewish law to describe a woman who has been validly married <coughs> under Jewish law and whose husband has disappeared. The aguna is literally the forsaken, the deserted woman. Now in American courts we have the so-called Enoch Arden law. If after seven years the husband doesn't show up, the wife may apply to the court and the court will say she is, her husband is as good as dead, she is now free. 
Jewish law knows of no such provision. To the contrary, Jewish law is quite clear on the subject. A husband is alive until he's proven dead. <laughs> and in order to prevent a person from committing adultery, or God forbid children from being bastards, it is terribly important that a woman whose husband might be alive should not be allowed to remarry. Therefore, a woman whose husband disappears on a boat, God forbid, there are no witnesses, or in a war, or, as occasionally happens even to a Jewish wife, he simply goes up and leaves. She has no legal recourse until a, a bill of divorce is produced from her husband, or until witnesses appear stating that her husband is dead, according to the Jewish interpretation of who a witness is and what he had to see and uh, the basis of Jewish testimony, that woman stays married. Now, this is all very well and good. But look what we have been through in the last 20 years. Think of all the young women who were married in Europe who were separated from their husbands in the concentration camps. Supposing it is not possible to establish the fact that the husband died. Or take World War II or the Korean War. Supposing the husband was lost in battle. And lost in battle in such a way that there are no valid witnesses of any kind around to verify that he actually died. Or supposing an airplane is lost and the bodies are not recovered. We presume that the airplane went down somewhere, a ship went down somewhere, and there's no recourse. Jewish law is quite clear. The woman is married and may not remarry. Now, says Kaplan, let us understand each other. What is it that we are dealing with? Who made this law? Now, in the Orthodox tradition, God made that law. God made it directly in what is given to us in the Torah and indirectly through the rabbis, but it's God's law. Kaplan says, forgive me. I understand you think it's God's law. As a modern man, I can't believe it's God's law. The only laws which I accept as validly binding are moral and ethical laws. There are moral and ethical standards which everybody has to observe because they are universal. And they're not Jewish, and they're not Russian, and they're not South African. There is a morality in which everybody is involved. If it's moral, it's universal. It's got to be. Therefore, says Kaplan, insofar as this rule is moral and ethical, everyone has to follow it. But this isn't a question of morality. This is a question of an administrative arrangement concerning the way of preserving the sanctity of marriage. It's one thing to say the marriage relationship is moral, and another thing to say that the way in which the court needs to administer the laws concerning marriage is such and such. Now, where do those things come from? Where do rituals come from? Where do ceremonies come from? Oh, says Kaplan, these are the creation of a people. The people creates its laws, its customs, its rituals, and its observances. And the people created this kind of Jewish law. But if the people created this kind of Jewish law, the people also has the right to change Jewish law. Not to change it radically, not to move so far forward that they're no longer the same people with the same point of view. But, says Kaplan, we need to move forward with this kind of law, and this is the kind of law which it would be helpful after due deliberation, we set up certain standards under which it would be possible to change. Kaplan is willing to change patterns of observance, rituals, and even parts of Jewish law based upon the needs of the Jewish people, interpreting as best it can what it thinks ought to be done. This is obviously not orthodox. And this is why he is a kind of reformed Jew. But the kind of reformed Jew who says, yes, I'm going to be more modern than the orthodox, but the reformed Jews are too modern. Now, why are the reformed Jews too modern? From Kaplan's point of view, the reformed Jews are too modern because of the simple fact that they have broken too radically with the tradition. They have broken too radically with the tradition 
primarily with regard to their understanding of what their group is. He's willing to admit that they're right when they talk about Jewish law developing and changing, and he's willing to say they've been very courageous in some of their ideas. But some of their ideas, he would also hold, are quite wrong. In one respect, he says they're not modern enough. Most of the Reformed Jews have tended to believe in the concept of the chosen people. As far as Kaplan is concerned, that's an immoral and vicious idea, and the Jews ought to give it up. So there he thinks that the Reformed Jews are a little too traditional. But he says that the Reformed Jews have made a basic mistake by trying to conceive of Judaism as just a religion. Now here he talks about the kind of Reformed Jews of whom we had spoken before, the Reformed Jews of the kind of Leo Beck, of Kaufman Kohler, whom I think we mentioned but briefly in passing, of the older Reformed Judaism before World War II. A Reformed Judaism which in part I think he helped to change. That's why I'm considering him this week and coming back to Reformed Judaism next week. Now what is Ka Kaplan's point? If you say that Judaism is a religion alone, you are saying Judaism is a way of believing, a kind of faith. But you leave out what is perhaps the most characteristic thing about the Jew, namely that he is a member of a people. It's true that Jews have been connected with religion all through their history, but they haven't been connected with it in terms of a creed or a set of dogmas. They've been connected with it because their people has been largely characterized by their religion. Now, what is this people? It is a sociological, ethnic unit. It's a, a people like every other people in the universe, like the, the French, the Germans, the, the Belgians, the name any group. A group which is characterized by language, by land, by history, by literature, by common hope and aspiration. That's the kind of, of group the Jews were. And they were distinguished by the fact that whereas in all other peoples a civilization is born in which religion is just one part of the civilization, when the Jewish people grew and developed, its civilization became entirely dominated by religion. Yes, it's possible for you to make the mistake today of thinking that the Jews have always been a religious group. But really, you misunderstand the basic factor about Judaism, which is that Judaism has been a people which has largely expressed itself through religion, and to the contrary. Jewish religion should be understood more in terms of a civilization than of the normal kind of, of truncated and desiccated and, and watered-down kind of, of ethics with preaching and a few sermons and hymns that many Americans take religion for. Religion is something through which a people expresses its whole way of knowing God and of knowing itself and of knowing what it needs to do in order to live up to itself. Now, says Kaplan, that's where the Reformed Jews were all wrong. That's why they weren't Zionists, because they didn't realize that the Jews were members of a people. That's why they weren't concerned with the Hebrew language so much, because of the fact that they thought of themselves as a religion. They could be religious in German or religious in English, but they ought to be religious in Hebrew because this is the language of their people. And this is why their religion was so thin and narrow. This is why they haven't had the ceremonies, why they don't have the holidays. This is why they don't have the, the whole substance which today goes under various names like Yiddishkeit or, or Jewishness, or like it's not warm. The whole aspect of living as a people, of the full range of the developed Jewish life, Jewish art, Jewish music, Jewish literature, Jewish jokes, Jewish food, all that's part of being religiously a Jew. Because being religiously a Jew is to be a member of a people. Now Kaplan's criticism, therefore, of the reformed Jew brings him considerably to the center after having pushed them all the way to the left. You notice how he can't feel at home either among the Orthodox Jews, with an idea of God like that and the rejection of the chosen people. He can't feel at home with the Orthodox Jews. And he can't feel at home with the Reformed Jews because even though they might take his idea of God, 
There was a time when they wouldn't have been very much interested in his idea of Jews being a member of a people. So their Kaplan is in the middle, you see. And during the late 1920s and the 1930s and even the early 1940s, Mordecai Kaplan unquestionably dominated the conservative movement. That is to say, intellectually, in terms of thinking, in terms of showing a, a movement and a development, a thrust toward the future, which was neither reform nor orthodox, that was extraordinary. And Kaplan's position, I think, indicates, too, what the great strength of conservative Judaism has always been and probably will always be. Now, this is a good time to set it forward as plain as it can be. Most American Jews don't think they can be orthodox, intellectually and in terms of practice. Either they want to believe in the theory of evolution or they enjoy eating shrimps. It's probably more stomach than mind with most of them. But the fact remains they enjoy eating shrimp and lobster and crab and even an occasional ham sandwich. They're not going to be orthodox. On the other hand, in the mines, particularly along the eastern seaboard in the great cities of Boston, uh, New York, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, and in all the big cities, wherever there have been large immigrant populations, to be reformed is to somehow be traith. To be a reformed Jew is to somehow be associated with something which isn't Jewish. You know, they don't have hats on, and uh, uh, it seems so strange. They pray in English, and uh, it's very stiff and very formal, and all the things that one looks for among a Jew one doesn't find. So therefore, where are the most American Jews going to go? They want to be more Jewish than the reformed Jew but more modern than the Orthodox Jew. And that's exactly where conservative Judaism claims to stand. Therefore, there is very little question that the conservative movement in the United States has exercised a tremendous appeal in terms of the loyalty of American Jews, in terms of what American Jews have felt their parents and their grandparents would like them to be as they grew up, and in terms yet at the same time of what the American culture would seem to require of them as being modern. Conservative Judaism unquestionably has a great future on the American scene as combining both these significant and important traits. As long as conservative Judaism can give to the individual Jew a feeling that he really is a Jew, and at the same time he really is an American, it solves the problem which we set out for ourselves at the beginning. Now, I hope I've made that perfectly clear to everybody because I'm not a conservative Jew. <laughs> and therefore, everything that I'm going to say from now on, I want you to see in terms of the positive position which conservative Judaism has. And uh, I think I have carefully concealed for you now for 22 weeks my own position with regard to any of these movements, making them clear. But I'm not orthodox and I'm not conservative, so that'll be a hint. <laughs> now, what is the problem with conservative Judaism? The problem with conservative Judaism is precisely in this position. If you want to say that you're more Jewish than the Reformed Jew and more modern than the Orthodox Jew, it's important to tell us exactly where you stand. But within the conservative movement itself, there is a rather radical difference of opinion as to where conservative Judaism does stand. And while I have used Mordecai Kaplan as a basis for expounding conservative Judaism to you, I'd like to show you the problems that Mordecai Kaplan gets into within the conservative uh, movement so that you can see the difficulties within the conservative movement itself and the problem that it poses for at least some American Jews. I believe it was last November at the Hotel Concord that the United Synagogue, the conservative movement, held a convention. And on the floor of that convention, Mordecai Kaplan appealed to the delegates at large that the entire conservative membership of this country should in some way seek to affiliate itself with the World Zionist Organization. After all, the Jews were a people. They ought to be united under organizational auspices. 
the conservative movement has been, in one way or another, hospitable to the Zionist movement from its very birth. Therefore, what more logical way could there be to indicate that the Jews need to unite as a people than to affiliate with the World Zionist Organization? Dr. Kaplan made this motion, and immediately at another microphone was standing another leader of conservative Judaism, Professor Abraham Heschel, a somewhat younger man, but a thinker uh, of considerable renown, and professor of, let's see, I think it's philosophy and mysticism, mysticism and philosophy, um, an interesting combination, um, at uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, who took the microphone and spoke against the proposition. The proposition was overwhelmingly defeated. Obviously, they wouldn't defeat it. Uh, one doesn't do that to elderly statesmen of a movement. It was sent to a committee to study. This is what one does in America to be kind uh, to people. But there was something symbolic there. Kaplan's point of view is not the point of view of conservative Judaism. And on many of the things that he stands for, precisely where he thinks he's being more modern, there are many conservative leaders who would disagree with him. Dr. Heschel, for example, would consider Kaplan's idea of God, although I don't think he would say so, a monstrosity. To say that because modern man's ideas change of the world, you have to change your way of thinking about God is putting it exactly backward. You make God change to fit your ideas, then who is more important, you or God? If God has to change all the time in order to fit into your point of view, then it's fairly obvious that you're God and he is a, a small servant. So today it's uh, modern thought and scientific thought. All right, there are ways of looking at God from that point of view as well. But the important thing is to take your scientific understanding and your whole knowledge of philosophy and history and all the rest and come to serve the God who is really there. You don't arrive at God after your thinking. You start with God. God must be the unspoken presupposition before you begin. If you don't start with God and his right to be God and his right to tell you what to do, then you've missed the whole point. You are blind to what is basic in the universe. And from Heschel's point of view, if you don't understand that God is really involved in giving the Torah, and the Jewish law is really God's law, even though there is room for interpretation and development, then you have missed the point entirely. Now let's apply this for a moment. From Heschel's point of view, may one turn on a television set to watch a cultural program on Saturday afternoon? The answer is no. I'm not certain even whether he would allow one to turn on a light, but a television program, certainly not even a cultural television program. This is not Shabbos stick. Or to make it even more clear, since I don't know really what he would say about the television program he hasn't written on the subject, on the question of the Aguna, Heschel might be willing to find a way out. But by and large, this is Jewish law and the development of Jewish law, and we need to stick by it. From Heschel's point of view, the woman whose husband is lost is married to him. Until we can find some way and means of changing Jewish law. So therefore, what's happened to the whole modern and progressive spirit of Kaplan? Well, for Heschel, and for a good many of the members of the faculty of the Jewish Theological Seminary, and for a good many of the congregations, the law is exactly what the law is for the traditional Jew. Some minor modifications, maybe, but not many. Or let me take another example. Let's take this simple question of the television set or of the Aguna and say, how would conservative Judaism seek to define them? Now, Kaplan would take the point of view, these are creations of the people. And the people have a right to change them. Heschel would take the point of view, yes, they are, but they're God's laws too. And that you therefore can't change them so easily. We obviously need some kind of a compromise. And a kind of a compromise has been offered. It is the suggestion by Robert Gordis, one of the great leaders of conservative Judaism, 
that what distinguishes the conservative Jew from either from his orthodox or his reform counterpart is his insistence on the maintenance of Jewish law, though it changes. Against the reform Jew, he would say, the reform Jew, he wants to change. He makes changes. He does what he wants to. If he feels like turning on the television, say he turns on the television set. What kind of a Jew do you call that? What has been the essence of Jewish life down through the centuries? The essence of Jewish life has been law. There was the law of the Torah. There was the law of the Mishnah. There was the law of the Talmud. There were the codes and the commentaries all the way through. Without Jewish law, you don't have a Jewish people. You don't have a Jewish religion. You don't have that basic institution which has kept the Jews alive. Therefore, we must hold on to Jewish law. And the Reform Jews, because they don't have Jewish law, are therefore the kind of people who have broken with an important institution in Jewish life. Now, the Orthodox Jews do have Jewish law, says Gordon. Ah! But they haven't let it develop and grow the way it needs to. And that's what we need to do. We're not going to do what the Orthodox do. Just simply let the law sit there. We're going to take the law forward and develop and change it. So, says Gordis, this is what distinguishes us. We are the forward developers of Jewish law. Therefore, with regard to turning the television set on on Saturday, he would say this is a question which we need to develop through Jewish law. And there is a commission on law and standards of the rabbinical assembly and of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, which is set up to study questions of modern law, and they will develop Jewish law and bring it forward. Now, this would really be a wonderful solution, would it not? It would be a solution to the problem of how one can be both traditional and modern by letting the law grow and develop. But it's very interesting to see what happens to it. Let us take the question of whether one may use electricity or one may turn on the television set to watch a cultural program on Saturday afternoon. The question was submitted to the Commission on Law and Standards about five or six years ago now of whether one may use electricity for Shabbistic purposes on Shabbos. And the committee went into it. It's very interesting to see what they did. What does the Jewish law have to say about electricity? You may think the Jewish law doesn't have anything to say about electricity, but it does. When electricity was first discovered, the rabbis at the time studied and ruled that electricity comes under one of the categories of work described in the Talmud, the category which is entitled, you may not kindle a fire. Because electricity is like a fire, it makes sparks and the rest. So they went into it and they studied it. Was the ruling to put electricity under fire an appropriate one? It was. Therefore, electricity is like a fire. And since you may not make a fire, you may not use electricity, because to make electricity is to make a spark, is to make a fire. And therefore, you shouldn't use electricity on Chavez. This was the basis upon which the traditional law decided that you might not turn an electric switch, and you may not turn an electric switch even if it's on a television set, even if it's to watch a cultural program. So half the commission decided that the traditional Jewish law had dealt with the subject. There it was. It was clear, and it was plain enough, and you don't do it. The other half of the commission said, yes, we studied, and we see it's very interesting. And it is true, but after all, is electricity fire? Electricity is like fire, but it really isn't fire. And what's more, what is the whole purpose of observing the Shabbos? The whole purpose of observing the Shabbos is to devote yourself to a certain kind of day. And what could distinguish this day more rather than certain kinds of cultural activities, assuming a person has studied and prayed and the like? If he uses electricity for Shabbistic purposes, it's not such a terrible thing. He should therefore be allowed to do it. But when the vote was taken, the decision was 50% against using electricity and 50% for using electricity. So where do we stand? What kind of guidance or benefit have we gotten? The individual rabbi and the individual congregation is then supposed to help his individual member make up his mind. The problem with trying to bring Jewish law forward is that as long as you are committed to the principle that whatever the Jewish law said was right and that you don't have a right to change it, you're going to have orthodox law. And once you are willing to change the traditional law, what are the criteria by which you are going to change it? What is the standard by which you are going to say this kind of a change is allowed and this kind of a change is not allowed? Now, from the Orthodox point of view, all of this is, to put it briefly, malarkey. 
There is one Orthodox law, there is one traditional Jewish law, and the only people who may change it are traditional Orthodox Jews. All the innovations by the conservative Jews with regard to Jewish law, they have rejected. So already one of the major purposes of a conservative Jew has been lost, to help Jewish law change and develop. The minute the conservative Jews change it, most of the Orthodox Jews, leaders, of course, find reasons for disregarding it. The second problem with regard to the changes of the law is that the changes of the law lag so far behind practice that it seems almost as if the law is following what the people are doing rather than giving leadership or guidance. It was in 1954, I think, that the question of electricity on Shabbos was finally discussed by the commission. Well, people have been using electricity on Shabbos for many years before and have done so since. Since that time, no major issue has come before this committee. Take the question of the Aguna. The woman whose husband was lost in World War II still cannot get a decision from the conservative movement as to whether or not she may remarry. Mordecai Kaplan can give her a decision, but the conservative movement cannot. The movement has not been able to move forward and develop and give this kind of guidance. And it has a major problem in that regard. If it cannot, over a period of years, begin to give positive leadership as to what a Jew in America ought to do or shouldn't do, then the whole point of talking about Jewish law will be lost. And as a matter of fact, to a rather prejudiced observer, while the conservative Jews complain about the reform Jews being goyim, it looks rather as if the conservative movement waits for the reform Jews to determine patterns, then picks up what it likes and discards what it doesn't like, and then after a while the scholars come along and say, oh yes, that's what the new Jewish law needs to be. If it weren't for the reform movement which had made the experiments and which had made the changes and the innovations, some of them obviously with certain mistakes, it would be difficult to know where the conservative movement would be today. If there were no reform movement, the conservative movement would probably have to invent one. So it wouldn't have to be involved in making the mistakes which those people are making. Now this is its strength. Its strength is that it's going to conserve. It's not going to make those errors of becoming non-Jewish, of becoming uh, too much like the, uh, the Protestant community in which we live. It's going to be more traditional and more authentic. But recognize that in order to do so, somebody else has got to be standing in the front line, carrying out uh, the experimentation and the adaptation, which then the rest of the community will come along to follow. And finally, as a matter of fact, most conservative Jews don't live by Jewish law anyway. It's one thing to say, yes, the movement is going to change by Jewish law. And it's another thing then to find people who care whether the Jewish law, as adapted or not adapted, says one thing or another thing. Mind you, I don't think that's a good thing. I don't defend it. I don't like it. But it indicates a problem. By the time the scholars finally get around to deciding a problem based upon whether or not the decision was correct that electricity is fire or isn't fire, who cares? Who really cares? Certainly most conservative laymen don't care. It is probably true that in terms of their normal practice, most conservative and most reform and even most orthodox Jews are indistinguishable. They are all reform Jews. Some may park a little further from the synagogue than others. Some may retain a few vestiges of performance. But outside their house, moving around the streets in the way they live their lives, they're all Reformed Jews, and they're all bad Reformed Jews. They all don't pray to amount to anything. They all don't study to amount to anything. They all don't observe to amount to anything. And therefore, to hope somehow to distinguish these people on the basis of Jewish law seems a shame. I wish it could work. But that's my personal critique. If a Jew wanted to live by Jewish law, if a Jew felt that he could get guidance in the middle, as many Jews feel, if a Jew felt that his emotional ties required him to be involved in this kind of a situation, it seems to me here is as legitimate and as authentic and as, as rich an identity of what it means to be a Jew in modern times as one could want. One could take it at either extreme, either from the mysticism of a Heschel, deeply immersed not only in Jewish lore, but in Jewish mystical lore, 
a man who, who senses and palpitates the, to the presence of God behind everything that exists. All the way out to a Mordecai Kaplan, whose point of view of God is so rationalistic and so contemporary that it's hard to believe that there's any God there at all, except in man's mind. And in this tremendous span of, of intellectual point of view, there are room for all kinds of Jews. That's the great strength of the conservative movement. The great strength of the conservative movement is its inclusiveness. There's room for everybody. And that's why it can't come to any decisions. Because if it ever came to a firm decision as to the, whether or not the Jewish law is God's or man's, as to whether or not the first five books of the Torah were written by people rather than by Moses at God's direction or by God himself, if it ever came to a decision as to whether or not that Aguna might remarry or might not remarry, if it ever came to a, a firm decision on any one of the contemporary questions which bother American Jews, it would lose some of the people who today comprise the movement. But to many people, that's not important. Many people don't want that clarity. They don't want that logic. They want a place where they can feel at home, where all their Jewish longings and aspirations can find some sense of response. They want enough English to understand what's going on, but enough Hebrew to remind them that it's a Jewish service. They want enough quiet in the synagogue so that they can feel that there's prayer going on, at the same time, they want the services conducted somehow as they have been traditionally so that they can recognize that this is the kind of service their father or their grandfather would recognize as their own service. They want to have modern ideas and modern thoughts, and yet they want to have the knowledge that the Hebrew language and the traditional Jewish sources play an important part in their lives and in the lives of their movement. I think there are a good number of American Jews for whom that kind of feeling, that kind of mood, that kind of emotion, with any one of the intellectual rationales which go to make it up, is the most important thing. And they can find in the conservative movement a way of being a Jew in our time, which will make them more than what they are today, and which I think will give them reason and significance and sense in being a Jew. But there are others who cannot. And to them and their problems, I shall have to turn next week. And now I've left you some time for questions. Yes, sir. On the question of Aguna, does the reform Judaism have a definite aspect? Yes. A woman whose husband is dead, who has been declared dead by the government or missing in action, whom any governmental law will accept, if the law of the state accepts her as divorced the, or now unmarried, the Jewish the reformed Jewish leaders will accept her as unmarried. Therefore, a good many Orthodox and conservative rabbis, when no one is looking, will send a Jewish woman who does not have a get to a reformed rabbi to be married by a Jew. Um, I detect a certain point of view in your question. And I would say from the point of view which you seem to hold, that would probably be a reasonable way of putting it. Yeah. What's your alternative? The alternative is for the conservative and the orthodox to be realistic. Well, the question is what realistic means, you see. Now, the conservative movement has invented a new marriage document, a new marriage contract, which, if people actually pay attention to it and use it over a good many years, would provide a basis in Jewish law, according to the conservative authorities, to obviate such problems. The Orthodox, however, denounce this marriage contract and say that this marriage contract is not a marriage contract which they will honor. And the procedures outlined under the marriage contract for dealing with such circumstances, they consider to be invalid, although they haven't been able to prove it so. Now, from the Reformed Jewish point of view, this seems like a ridiculous lot of trouble to go to for something that nobody is terribly much concerned about. Namely, if you're just looking for an excuse to get this woman free anyway, why don't you say she's free? Rather than go to all the trouble of calling meetings and sessions and writing separate Aramaic contracts in order to justify her on the basis of a law which you know is obsolete to begin with. It's the same contract which calls for the husband to pay the, the wife's father 200 zuz 
for this uh, virgin. And uh, no one pays any attention to that, to that condition of the contract. It's a little hard to know why anyone should care whether there's a provision there that under certain circumstances, the court may act in the place of the husband in the granting of a divorce. The Reformed Jew takes a rather radical point of view with this regard. And while it's an unpleasant one for people who are not Reformed, it makes a lot of sense to other people of whom I am one. Yes? Well, who observes them? Dr. Kaplan observes them, and Dr. Gordis and Dr. Heschel. Yes, and I believe the United Synagogue has a rule which says that congregations which are part of the United Synagogue must have kosher kitchens. But a survey taken of the leadership of conservative Jewish congregations, I believe it was by Dr. Emil Lehman, unless I am wrong, about four years ago, showed that an overwhelming majority of conservative leaders, presidents and officers and trustees of congregations, don't keep kosher. They don't keep kosher and they do each trade. Well, you see, this is the problem. It's a, it's a very serious problem. And of course, the conservative movement has tried to revive interest in, uh, and meaning in Kashrus and its place in Jewish life. And it will be very wonderful to see what might happen under it. There's a recent pamphlet by uh, a rabbi, Samuel Dresner, um, in, of Springfield, Massachusetts, on the dietary laws as a means to being a holy person. And it is hoped that through this kind of appeal, many people will be read to observe the dietary laws. After all, when there's no longer a thrill, you know, in being able to sneak a ham sandwich, uh, if, if you're no longer showing your immigrant father or grandfather that you're an American, maybe people can start keeping kosher again. On the other hand, if you could either keep kosher or not keep kosher, the problem is whether God really cares whether you have two sets of dishes or not. See, that's the tough problem. Now, the legal problem involved there is a very interesting one. A dish which absorbs the food, you have to have two kinds of those dishes because it may have absorbed something, and thereby, when you are eating on it, what was absorbed may leak out, and it might be milkshakes and flashics mixed. And whether it's a 60th or not, which is permitted, makes no difference. If it's a possibility that it might happen, you have two sets of dishes. Now. When chinaware, with the glaze over the clay, first became available, the question was raised by the rabbis. Is a china plate to be considered as a porous kind of plate which does absorb? Or is it to be considered like a glass plate which doesn't absorb? If it is like a glass plate which doesn't absorb, then there is no question of anything being mixed inside the plate. And therefore, you may use a glass plate both for millichicks and flashings. Now, what did the rabbis rule? On the basis of what china, I do not know. <laughs> they ruled that a china plate is absorbent. And all china plates to this day are ruled by Jewish law as absorbent. Now, you and your wedge would, and whatever else you are using, may not believe it. <laughs> But this is the basis upon which the entire question, and this is the problem that the average American Jew has to face. As he looks at his plate, and he sees the high gloss which is put out, and he says, two set of dishes. If I thought God really cared, I might do it. But because the rabbis ruled at one point in Jewish law is such and such. See, this is the difficulty with this point of view. And it will be very interesting to see what the conservative Jews can manage in this regard. No one knows. The Torah, it, it, it's not rational at all. The Torah is quite explicit on the subject. You may not eat these animals. And it doesn't say because of biological reasons. And it doesn't know anything about trichinosis. And it doesn't know anything about being dirty. And it doesn't know anything about being unclean. The first hygienic explanation that we get of the dietary laws is close to the year 1000 of the Common Era. The Bible doesn't know anything about it. And the Talmud doesn't know anything about it, by and large. And it's only moderns who have tried to explain why someone should do it who gave the reason. And, you know, the minute you give a reason, there's a counter reason. You shouldn't eat the pork because of trichinosis? All right, so I'll cook it. Well done. <laughs>
It's interesting to watch what a Jew does when he wants to get around Jewish law. First came parava margarine. There is now margarine, which is guaranteed by traditional authorities to be parava. So that a good Orthodox Jew may finally get the butter that he wanted all along to eat with the meat. When the par and it's perfectly legal, and there's no question about it. And as, once the legality is there, you're in good shape. All right. When the par of a margarine came out, I said in a joke, somebody is going to invent par of a cream for the coffee industry. <laughs> I swear to that. Now there is par of a cream. Of course there is. There is now par of a, it's a whitish, it's a whitish liquid which is guaranteed, yes, I do not lie to you, which is guaranteed by traditional authorities to be absolutely non-animal. Now, I wish to, really, if, I don't mean to make fun, but I want to point to you, what is the movement of the people? They don't want to keep the law, they want to get around the law. The law is a nuisance, it's troublesome. The Jewish caterer today is not how to handle tuna fish in such a way that they shape it like a lobster. <laughs> You're not allowed to, you know, they make a lobster thing with it and they shape it, but it's really tuna fish. The point is they know you want to eat lobster. So as a result, they handle the fish in such a way to make you feel that you are eating lobster, but it happens to be kosher, so you're not allowed to eat lobster. May I give you what I would consider to be, and I, I really, I, I hope you don't think that I am making fun, but I, I do, in, in the most serious sense, believe that you ought to see what Jews do with regard to the law to see the problem with the law. And since it's quite clear that my point of view to the law is not a traditional one, um, I, I hope you will understand that I say it out of a certain kind of reverence, which I hope will be clear to you by next week. Let me give you what it would seem to my somewhat perverted sense of humor to be the ultimate in this direction. We now have parava margarine, so we've got butter, we have parava cream. So you can now have cream in your coffee. And a long time ago, they figured out a way to make almost ice cream. No, now I'm going to give you the, the next step. If I were a rich, traditional Jew, I would set up an institute whose research project would be very simple. It would breed pigs and hybridize pig, pigs and cross-breed pigs until a pig was produced that not only had a cloven hoof as it now has, but chews its cut. <laughs> because as soon as a pig is produced that not only has a cloven hoof, but chews its cud, you can have all the ham and bacon you want under kosher auspices. And, be and believe me, with my good Jewish seichel, I would see to it that when this pig was bred, it was tastier and juicier so that everybody would want them. We would drive the pigs off the market and let only kosher pigs remain. And this would be the end of the problem of kashas. No, it's not bacon. It's cow meat of a certain variety that you can imitate it, but those people who want bacon are not satisfied with uh, the so-called kosher bacon. Yes, sir? Sir, the craving? Yes, you, you maintain that there are any number of people that have this desire, this, this craving for this wonderful belief, and find it impossible to believe in the traditional sense. Uh, you've taken up something that I've like you said, it's apparently on the course, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I'm not going to sense man's relation to man, man's relation to God. I think it's one of the important things to do with the belief. Yes, I, I would agree entirely. Now, you see, from here, I, I think Kaplan's point of view is one of the great contributions of Jews in modern time. For many Jews, what Kaplan has had to say on the subject of God, for him, for example, ethics is always more important than ritual acts. And while Kaplan himself happens to be an observant Jew, and while he thinks that if Jews had his point of view with regard to the Jewish people, that they would always tend to observe some of the traditional Jewish ways of doing things, Nonetheless, the ritual obviously is secondary, and there might be rather radical changes in it over a period of time. No, I agree with you. The emphasis needs to be put on rethinking man's relationship to God. And as I shall try to say to you next week, it seems to me that the only way to get back to Jewish observance in any legitimate way in our time 
is to start not the way the conservative movement proposes, not to start from the point of view of trying to hold on to as much as we can and getting people to increase it uh, step by step, as much as it is to rebuild the relationship between the individual and his God by thinking through the issues. I think Kaplan is largely right in what he has to say. Only from my point of view, I think one needs to go a step further. It's interesting that Kaplan has affected the reform Jewish movement probably as much, if not more, as he has affected the conservative movement. Because in the conservative movement, where he's been liberal, he's been considered too liberal for it. But I do think that the emphasis upon the basic relationship between man and God and on ethics is critical. Yes, sir. Uh, the chosen people idea seems that the three wings of Judaism, Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, they believe in it. Catherine and the Reconstructionists would not. Correct. Please explain that. We explain it because of the fact that Kaplan does not want to hesitate in moving forward into the future. And he says if any group thinks it's any better or different from the others, it only causes difficulty in getting along with the other groups. Therefore, if the Jews really want to be ethical, the most important thing that they could do would be to give up their most unethical idea. Namely, we're different, we're special, we're superior people. Now, it seems to me that Kaplan again speaking from my point of view, puts the cart before the horse. I never met a Jew who thought he was better than a non-Jew by virtue of a serious consideration of the concept of the chosen people. What makes him feel sometimes that he's better than a non-Jew? He's been persecuted and beaten and his only way to react to the minority status he's in is to feel superior. Therefore the problem is not a problem of theology, it's a problem of sociology. And Kaplan tries to do away with a sociological reality by changing the theology. One should not change one's theology, one's religious beliefs, because of the status among which people live. To the contrary, a belief is a belief. Now, if I understand that by people kicking me around, I am forced to sometimes react by saying I'm better, I say to myself, is that why you somehow think you're better? And then I take a look at the point of view that the Jews have had. Have the Jews thought they were better? Not particularly. They merely thought that they had been given something that no one else had. And as a matter of fact, they were. I, I don't know how you can get around it. The Bible was written in Hebrew. We can go on for 10 million years in human history. The fact will never change. Yeah, but why do they have to use the chosen people? Why do we have to say to the chosen people? Because, because the, the Torah... Like, what, what, Let's, uh, oh, that's a different question. The first question is, did God choose us from among other peoples to give us the Torah? The answer is yes, because the Torah is not written in Spanish, Arabic, or Swahili. It's written in Hebrew. At least he chose us. At least insofar as there is a God in the universe, our people came to know him. Now, the question is as to whether we are still God's chosen people, in some sense, in some legitimate sense, this is a difficult question. I have an answer to it, but it would take the better part of an evening to give. I regret that I'm only able to take a question or two. Let me try to do them real well, fast. I just want to say that some of the lines about the Torah people, isn't that what the It's a service. There's a difference between our kind of being chosen and some other people's because we are chosen to serve. Yes, Kaplan, Kaplan recognizes part of that, but he still thinks it's an invidious comparison. Yes, you wanted to ask one question? Well, if the Jews are different, they don't remain Jews, do they? Well, he says everyone ought to remain different simply by being a member of a people. Everybody's a member of a people, and everyone ought to stay a member of a people, and no one who's a member of a people can be himself without fulfilling what it is to be a member of a people. Therefore, the only reason that a Jew ought to be a Jew is because he was born a Jew, and everybody ought to stay a member of his people. Now, that has a certain amount of sense to it, but uh, I doubt that it would hold for many Jews over a period of time. Yes, you have an urgent question. Uh, who took it away? Well, who took the law away? I'm not taking Torah away. I'm, well, I'm glad you asked the question because now I have an opportunity to say what I always love to say each Tuesday evening, namely, 
that if you will come next week, the last time you do this, uh, as you leave this evening, as you leave this evening, um, I have something for you. Um, I've been invited to come back next year to do another series of lectures. I thought you might be interested in seeing what we will probably do next year. So I prepared an outline, a very brief outline of lectures. I thought you'd like to see what they were like. I shall see you next week. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.